going to go on to my second talk, which is uh, results of the endovascular access trial called NEAT. And this study, uh, NEAT stands for Novel Endovascular Access Trial, and we did this study looking at using this device in pre-dialysis and dialysis patients internationally. The purpose of the study was to evaluate the safety and efficacy of the Everlink endofistula system. The primary endpoint was maturation of the endofistula, uh, which was defined by a uh, vessel flow of greater than 500 milliliters per minute and greater than 4 millimeter vein diameter, with the patient being dialyzed with two needles. Uh, we also had as a, sec as a secondary co-primary uh, safety endpoint, and we needed 80 patients um, to get our sample size of 60. We allowed 20 roll-in patients because this procedure had not been done before, and the operators needed an uh, opportunity to get their technique down before we entered these patients to be evaluated in the study. So the first uh, North American patient with this endovascular fistula was created on January 14th, 2014. Billy Cohen uh, is the person that made that natural observation in the emergency room. Uh, Diraj Rajan was here last year. He was the interventionist, and I was the uh, clinical trialist uh, who managed this program of research. One of the key things that people ask is, you know, who is eligible to have this type of fistula created? And really the key thing is we really, really need this perforating vein because even if you connect the artery and the vein below, if there's no perforator, there's no, not going to be any flow to this superficial system. So one of the key things is to have that perforating vein and to make sure that the vessels are large enough to have these magnetic catheters go into them. So those are really two of the, the really critical criteria for uh, creating this endovascular fistula. In order to do this study, we evaluated 183 patients, enrolled our target 80, uh, 60 cohort patients and, and 20 roll-in patients, and I'm going to show you the results at 12 months. So the patient characteristics, uh, the average age was significantly higher by a decade than the Paraguay studies at approximately 60 years. 63% uh, of them had a BMI greater than 25, so very consistent with the uh, North American population. 65% uh, had diabetes, 92% had hypertension, about a third had previous AV fistulas, and over half of them were actually pre-dialysis patients. So this was the general characteristics of our population. The results, we had excellent technical success of 98%. We only had one fistula that was not created, and it wasn't created because during the procedure, a braided uh, introducer sheath was used, and when you use that type of sheath, the radio frequency energy was dissipated, and it did not deliver the energy, so there was no fistula created. Uh, the adverse events was 8.3%, um, so I will show you those details later, and nobody had a procedure-related infection. In terms of our primary endpoint, in physiologic maturation, 91% of patients met the primary endpoint. Uh, in terms of the brachial artery flow, this was our target, 500 milliliters per minute. And as you can see from baseline, it went from 81 milliliters per minute to 785 really quickly, and then proceeded to be maintained at a high level over a year. The vein diameter target was four millimeters, and you can see that in all of the draining veins that could be used for cannulation, the median cubital, cephalic vein, and basilic vein, they all achieved that target. This is what it looks like five days after the procedure. You can see the, uh, the fistula here. There's no incision lines um, because there is no uh, surgery that opens the skin. Uh, there's early dilatation of the veins. And in a month, you can see the beautifully uh, dilated vessels so that they're ready to be cannulated with multiple cannulation zones available. In terms of functional usability, very similar to a surgical fistula, 67% of these fistulas were functionally cannulated for dialysis. Um, of note, only 12% of them required any intervention to facilitate its use. Um, because of the research protocol, the first time to cannulation was on average 112 days for dialysis patients and 32 days for pre-dialysis patients. 
So why were patients not cannulated? Uh, we had nine endofistulas that were not uh, able to be cannulated, uh, three with late thrombosis. Two of the vessels were too deep, and at that time we did not elevate. Um, two patients were really afraid of needles, and regardless of whether or not they would have had a surgical or an endofistula, they probably would not have uh, used their fistula for cannulation. One patient had steel syndrome, and one patient was transferred to a non-study site, and they were unaware of this fistula and afraid to cannulate. In terms of adverse events, uh, you will see that most of the adverse events were actually related to the brachial uh, vessel access and exit. So we actually had five patients who had nine events. So for example, um, in terms of access and exit, we used a closure device. The operator chose to use one, and that was associated with multiple events, including a pseudoaneurysm at the access site. We did have a brachial artery dissection, which also was associated with the uh, brachial artery thrombosis that led to Steele syndrome. So multiple events occurred in uh, several people, and we only had one device-related AE. In terms of thrombosis, these are the results. You can see at six weeks and at three months, we only had 1.8% early thrombosis. Later thrombosis, we had 5.3% at six months, 10.5% um, at 12 months. And when you compare this with surgery, it compares quite favorably. This is uh, from the surgical literature with a less than three-month thrombosis rate of 5 to 10, 26% compared to less than 1.8% in our patients, and greater than three months, 14 to 26%, uh, which uh, the endofistula favors uh, nicely. In terms of post-creation procedures, we went on to do another study. We did a propensity score matched analysis, um, matching up the endofistula patients with patients who had surgically created fistulas in the U.S. population. And what we found was that the rate of interventions with the endofistula was only uh, 0.6 interventions per patient year versus 3.4 per patient year in the surgically created uh, fistulas. So this is approximately six times fewer post-creation procedures with the endofistula. Uh, this has been published in Dr. Galliani's Journal of, of Vascular Access, and you can look at this publication there. In terms of patency, the primary patency was 68.6%. This is one-year patency, and 83.5% was the secondary patency. And we can, when we compare this with our surgical fistulas, this was a meta-analysis that was done uh, with 46 publications with 62 unique cohorts and a population of greater than 12,000. You can see that the primary failure in this surgical um, cohort was 60% primary uh, patency and 71% uh, secondary patency in comparison to the endofistula. So this is our first patient that was ever enrolled in the study using her endofistula at uh, six months. Uh, and then functional patency in our study was 92.4%. And this was a patient who was uh, in the FLEX study, the Paraguay study, the pilot study, and he's now been using his fistula for over three years. The cannulation options, there are multiple options, the forearm uh, cephalic and upper arm cephalic in an 82-year-old woman. Uh, this man had a BMI of 44, and he's using his forearm cephalic in median cubital or basilic. So you have multiple sites of cannulation, so there's no issue with recirculation. And then here we are cannulating the forearm cephalic as well as the basilic. Uh, this is the distribution of needle cannulation locations. 58% of them were cephalic and cephalic cannulations. This is just a video because I have a little bit of time to show you uh, how it's cannulated. It's just cannulated like any other type of AV fistula. Um, just use your physical examination, palpation. Uh, this is a two and a half year old endofistula standard cannulation techniques apply. And in fact, you actually don't even need to use a tourniquet because of the way the, the blood flows and the anatomy. It has a little bit of a different feel. It goes in smoother without the same give as a surgically created fistula, but you can see that it's quite easily cannulated, and this patient is using their fistula at a blood flow rate of 400 milliliters per minute. 
So the study has finally been published, so you can check it out online at AJKD. It was a very long uh, work in progress, and we're very proud of this publication. Um, and I just want to especially thank the investigators uh, in Canada, uh, University of Toronto, British Columbia, Lake Ridge Health, Montreal, University Health, London, Ontario, um, and Halifax, as well as sites in New Zealand and Australia. And I just want to tell you, you know, coming up in the future, as I said, main, many of the major complications was due to the brachial uh, vessel access using the six French catheters. And now we're developing a smaller uh, catheter, a four French catheter, so that we can have more distal access to create this fistula. This is the program of research, uh, the FLEX study, I've showed you the results of the pilot study, the NEAT study was the, the, the main presentation. We have a study ongoing in Europe uh, which will look at the four French design and then um, because it has CE mark, a post-market uh, study in the uh, Europe countries. So to conclude, uh, NEAT demonstrates that the Everlink uh, technology can reliably create an AV fistula without open surgery. It can be used successfully to deliver dialysis and it has high primary and secondary patency. And the endo fistula may provide an alternative option for hemodialysis access. And very importantly, I had the great pleasure of meeting uh, Dr. Brescia and I presented this to him and he said that he really liked it. So it made me very happy. <laughs>